Okay, here's the video lecture, first part, uh, for Riverside High School and Herbert Hoover High School. Uh, this is the last unit, and you'll need to take some notes uh, on this. This is going to be really, really important. Uh, for some of you, there's a little bit of this you may have already seen in class that you'll uh, you'll definitely want to, to 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 be looking at this. So we're going to be talking about racism, po uh, racism, poverty, crime, education, housing, and fiscal crisis that occurs, especially in cities in the United States. So we're heading into the end of the of the unit here. Housing uh, in U.S. cities, millions of poor people, mostly minorities live in substandard housing that's characterized by structural defects, inadequate plumbing, inadequate heating, and inadequate sanitation. A lot of people think, well, why would someone choose to live in substandard housing? What you're going to realize very quickly, especially in cities and more specifically in inner cities, you have densely populated minorities, largely African Americans, who are sort of trapped. They're, they're living in, in terrible conditions. A lot of them are poor. They can't afford to get up and move out into a better neighborhood, into a better apartment, into, or into a nicer home for a lot of reasons. So they're left to deal with these, these problems that we'll talk about as we go. Some images of substandard housing, if you will. Uh, there's an image of the, uh, the projects, if you will, from an inner city in this country. This is a, st a story of a young girl, and you can't see it real well because the picture is a black and white image, but that's black mold growing all through here where the shower and the tub is. If you don't know anything about black mold, it's not really safe to ingest or to be around. It can cause really nasty things like you know death, and cancer, things of that sort. Now, you look at this little girl, and you think, well, why does she choose to live here? Why can't children perform well in school in these cities? Why, why can't they make a better life, uh, better lives for themselves and get up out of this situation? Well, it's just not that easy. Children, ha children have no say in terms of where they're born, who they're born to, the conditions that they have to live in and endure. So do people choose to live in these conditions? The answer is largely no. It's not exclusively no, but the vast majority of people do not choose to live this way. Uh, especially children. Now, some do, perhaps, um, but the vast majority do not. So why do people live in the following deplorable conditions in U.S. cities? Again, some images of inner cities in this country. Homes that are falling apart. This is a woman who has no running water um, in her kitchen. So she has resorted to washing dishes in her bathtub. And you can see the bathroom is not a very clean, nice-looking place either. Uh, people are faced with limited options in cities like this uh, due to the reduction in the number of low-rent housing units, due to cuts in government funding, overcrowding and rundown apartments and housing, and increasing homelessness. So these are all real problems that create limited options for people who live in conditions like this, like this, believe it or not, like this. Now, housing problems have been around in the U.S. for a long time, but it wasn't really until the Great Depression of the 1920s that the United States government first took steps to address housing problems. And we're going to be talking about the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Those of you who have had history, uh, you maybe you've, you've heard of the New Deal that was under the administration of FDR. Uh, the New Deal uh, provided money to promote the construction of new homes. Also, it offered assistance to homeowners who were unable to pay their mortgage debts, guaranteed construction loans to increase the supply of housing, and also hired unemployed workers to build low-rent public housing. So government money, guaranteed construction loans, hiring of unemployed workers is really going to start to reshape and rebuild literally and figuratively uh, housing in this country. After the Second World War, the federal government expanded mortgage guarantees to veterans and also to middle income families, um, so expanding this even more. In 1949, the Housing Act um, gave the federal government the ability to seize decaying property and sell them to private developers for redevelopment. So now we have the ability for the government um, to go in and buy buildings that are falling apart, 
like the one we just looked at. I'll see if I can find it real quick. I think it was that one. Yeah, to buy properties like this, so they can sell it to a private developer who can make it look nicer. Maybe tear it down, build something else there, or redevelop it completely. In addition to lack of affordable housing, some parts of the city suffer from serious deterioration, abandonment of buildings, the relocation of economic activities to the suburbs, and the outmigration of wealthier people to the suburbs. So in addition to housing problems, you have you know, just all kinds of other problems. When everybody is leaving, middle class and upper class people leave cities that are falling apart, it leaves behind those poor people to pay more taxes because there's less people there. Also, it takes away a lot of the economic activities. Businesses are going to close down. Stores are going to shut down because there aren't as many people there to sustain and maintain those businesses. And the remaining city dwellers are poor. They're unable to pay high rents because what's going to happen is that the landlords are losing people in their apartments in their substandard housing. They're not going to be able to you know, maintain their profit line, so they're going to try to raise the rent. So, and it's going to also decrease the incentive for landlords to make repairs because that costs them money. So it just creates a host of problems. Now, public programs have been designed to revive cities, and they've largely failed in this country, and I don't want to beat you up with all that. Just kind of understand that. Um, however, two private movements have achieved some positive results. The first one is called homesteading. Uh, local governments began giving buildings to people in groups who are willing to rehabilitate them. A Habitat for Humanity comes to mind. I know a family personally who are, they are living in a home that was rebuilt by the Habitat for Humanity uh, Association. I coached basketball some years ago with a gentleman who lived in one of these homes that were rebuilt by Habitat for Humanity. Another private movement that has seen uh, some success in decaying inner cities is gentrification. This is when wealthier people have renovated decaying areas of cities. They've spent their own money or raised their own money to rebuild homes that are falling apart. If you ever watch the Home and Garden channel, the Home Improvement channel, like House Hunters International and all those shows, um, there's a show on uh, on there about a woman. I think her name is Nicole Curtis, and she actually spends her life renovating decaying homes in Detroit, Michigan. I think the show is called Rehab Addict. Uh, she talks about being addicted to rehabilitating these decaying homes. Being from Detroit, Michigan, she just is really sad and upset about the horrible conditions and, and that are there economically, physically, high crime rate. It's not a great place to live, unfortunately. And her show chronicles how she goes through and just rebuilds these houses that look like crap and makes them look really nice. And it increases property value. It attracts more people back into those inner cities. So there are some positive effects of gentrification as well. Now, gentrification is a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. Because what happens is that it, in it inadvertently raises property values. So poor people who are already living there now that things are being rebuilt and revitalized, huh, their property is now worth more. So landlords think, oh, I can get more rent from this place. So if I'm a poor person living in Detroit and all of a sudden the property values around me go up, now what I'm living in, even if it's a rat trap, the value of that place is going to increase. So my landlord is going to realize, oh, Brandon, you're paying $300 a month. I can now get $500 a month for where you're living. I can't pay that, so that displaces me. So now I'm homeless or I'm looking for somewhere else to live. So it raises property values and it can also displace the poor. So it can create those kinds of problems as well. I'm going to call this the end of the first part. Thanks.